Hello, Internet. Welcome to episode 309 of the Assorted Calibers podcast. The second other podcast. There's a little bit for everyone. And with me tonight, she is wonderful. She is great. She's the greatest hostess in the world, and I'm lucky to have her, Erin Paulette. How you doing, Erin? Doesn't matter. Yeah. Still feeling a little down, Erin? Doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, I've had I've, I've had I've had a rough week myself. So, uh, yeah, I uh, I will just say I, I I mentioned last week that we uh, we had to take an emergency trip to Maine uh, for uh, for a family member who was dying, and uh, yeah, it was only a couple of days after we recorded that uh, he did finally pass, and he was surrounded by his family. It was uh, it was as good a death as anyone can get, and uh, he will be greatly missed. And then. Uh, there was uh, another another family party that had been planned, and uh, everybody showed up for it, and it was uh, it was it was a good event. It was a good event, and then yeah, we've got a got a funeral to go to later this week. So yeah, there's a there's a lot of heavy emotions here, and uh, so uh, I I I think Aaron, I don't think you will uh, you'll argue with me much that we should uh, that we should dive into the news. Yeah, the news is surprisingly good. I was very very surprised i just start collecting the news just as it comes across my desk and i just have just i just just open up browser tabs and then when i'm making the show notes i just i just start reading them and sorting them and uh and seeing what's going on and i'm just like okay well we should put some bad the bad ones up front and then and then work our way into the uh you know into the good ones to end on a positive note that's generally how i like to sort them and yeah, there really there really isn't that much bad news. Mm-hmm. So, so let's let let us start off with. I mean, th- this first one is was, you sent me, so I, I think I think you should take it. Well, I'll start off because it deals with Massachusetts, and I know that you're going to want to talk about it. And you are boots on the ground there. So, this was actually brought to my attention by the chapter head of the Boston Pink Pistols, and I really appreciate him doing that. And he sent me a link to this case. It's called Commonwealth v. Donald. Actually, it's it's two cases rolled into one. Um, Commonwealth is the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and one of the defendants is Donald, and the other one is Marquis. And because the cases are basically about the same thing, it got rolled into one case. And this is a case where they were actively soliciting um, amicus briefs. And I went, oh, wow, thank you very much. And I sent an email about this to my uh, amicus guy, uh, Costas Moros of uh, Michelle and Associates. And he responded with, yeah, we're actually getting ready to file uh, to file that. You know, d- do you want in? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh it's actually been filed ooh, like the 31st. And so it's just like any of Costas's briefs. It's a real barn burner. And I encourage you all to read it. But here is the short version. So in this case that involves both Mr. Donnell and Mr. Marquis, they are uh, residents of New Hampshire and they are not prohibited people. And it's worth pointing out that um, New Hampshire is constitutional carry, so you don't need a carry permit. And what they were doing was they were driving through Massachusetts. It's not clear whether they were on their way to or from New Hampshire, but they both had some sort of interaction with the police. I know that with Donald there was an accusation of driving while intoxicated. I didn't see anything else like that with Marquis, but they had an interaction with the police and they were arrested for having a firearm in their car. And uh, the way Massachusetts is set up, weird, I know you're going to want to interrupt. Please restrain yourself for a moment. I will. Um, <laughs> um, so Donald was arrested for having a, a high-capacity ammunition feeding device, a.k.a. Uh, a magazine of excess of 10 rounds. And both of them were arrested for, for having ammunition because 
in the Democratic People's Republic of Massachusetts, uh, you have to have a carry permit to even have ammunition with you. And so they had all of these charges filed against them, and there was a, uh, I believe, a conviction on both of them, and both of them uh, appealed, and the appeal was based upon Bruin and, well, it was only Bruin at the time, because I believe this this happened last year, and now it's being argued under Rahimi as well. And uh, they're basically saying that the that Massachusetts having a law barring carry without a license is unconstitutional. And yeah, I apologize. I'm not at my best. I'm not explaining this well. But the the argument put forward is this: um, you have these two men who are not prohibited people, and they are exercising their Second Amendment rights in New Hampshire, and everything is fine. Uh, they cross the border into Massachusetts, and it sure seems like they're following the the FOPA rules of of travel. You know, they they aren't staying there; they're just traveling, and they are arrested for breaking Massachusetts firearm law, and Massachusetts requires them to get a non-resident permit, which can take up to 90 days and lasts for a year. Only a year. And they're arguing this is both um, unreasonable and uh, an infringement of their rights under Bruin because, okay, you're in New Hampshire and you have freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and freedom of religion. You cross into Massachusetts, you still have freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. But in New Hampshire, you have the right to keep and bear arms. You cross a state line. You don't have the right to keep and bear arms. You know, it's the only constitutional right that ends at state lines. And so under this argument, and they literally say this court can think of no other constitutional right which a person loses simply by traveling beyond his home state's border. Um, and so... Oh, okay. The the trial court granted this motion, and then the state appealed. And then, in a very unusual move, the Massachusetts Supreme Court decided that instead of going through the appeals process, they would take it directly. And then they asked explicitly for amicus briefs. And so that brings us where we are today. And it's really... Well, I find it interesting. It's like a 40-page document, and Costas does his usual technique of of taking um, the opposition behind the woodshed and beating them senseless. I think it's a fun read. I don't know if you'd feel the same way. And so there are a lot of us represented on this brief, including California Rifle and Pistol Association, Gun Owners of America, Gun Owners of California— uh, Second Amendment Defense and Education Coalition, and Federal Firearms Licensees of Illinois. And so that's really all I have to say on the matter. Weird, I'm sure you have something to add. Yeah, I, not a whole lot, because you you actually did a great job of covering Massachusetts law, which I will add that uh, I have absolutely fumbled on covering other states' laws. Of I got the beats of most of them, but there's some finer stuff. Yeah, the only thing that I think think is not true is very recently and i don't even know when this happened like it was it i think it was kind of pushed very quietly or it was uh like an amendment to another bill that was going through but the non-resident permit is now four or five years uh just like the um um the the uh the the resident permit but uh as a little bit of nuance for Yes, that's a little bit more reasonable. Now it's more on par with, say, the New Hampshire non-resident carry permit that you don't really need because New Hampshire's constitutional carry now. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, unlike those state permits, you need to apply for the Massachusetts one in person. And uh, and that's in Chelsea, Mass., which is a, a suburb of Boston that is uh, not not a nice suburb of Boston. Uh, mm. and so it, it, it is, yeah, it does take time and, but it also requires multiple trips into Boston, which 
you know, Boston is, you know, you know, a half hour to 45 minute drive, you know, hour and a half in traffic uh, from really any any place on the New Hampshire border. And then if you're in a place like, you know, Lebanon or someplace like that, that's, you know, in the northern tip of uh, of, of New Hampshire, you know, near the Canadian border, you know, that could be, you know, essentially, you know, a, a, a you know, four or five hour drive just to get just to get there to apply and then you need to take multiple trips to end up getting this uh to end up getting this permit so it is yeah very very difficult and uh you know the 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 key factor is hey guess what carry permits are relatively recent things i actually don't know when the first uh what what state first started issuing carry permits but uh I, I really want to say I really want to say it was Florida in 1987. I could be wrong. No, no, no. But... I I mean the the that's 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 definitely the uh yeah in, with the concealed carry revolution as they called it. Uh, but I'm I'm talking about like the old school uh carry permits, and I, I I've got to wonder. Oh, if like that... like Sullivan Act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was, okay. yeah, there was a, the Sullivan Act was definitely one of them, but I, 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 I'm, I'm willing to bet that the first one started coming through either, either in the pre, uh, pre Civil War South or, uh, or antebellum South would be what my guess would be. Um, that, that literally the same thing. Uh, a- and a- antebellum literally means pre Civil War. Anti before bellum war. Uh, no, anti is after. Pre bellum would be before. Well, now I got to look it up. Um, did I? Did I get that? I, I may have that wrong. Um, I mean, you, well, you, you've instituted enough doubt. Well, see, antediluvian means before the flood. Okay. Well, then I. So. Um, yep. Belonging to the period before a war. I have been saying yeah. it wrong for a long time. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> so I. Yeah. Well, you said it with such confidence that I went, "Oh crap! Maybe I'm wrong." That's because that's what you call false confidence. <laughs> I I 100% believe that that was true. But yes, I it, it was either yeah, it was either antebellum south or reconstruction south would be my guess, but I'm not really sure. I mean, I know I know that Maine has had carry permits uh for a long long mm-hmm. time. Also another interesting thing to add on is that um is that I know that Maine and New Hampshire before they went constitutional carry um, had um, uh, still allowed open carry without a permit. So it was only the permit was only for concealing a firearm. If you wanted to carry car- carry a, carry a pistol openly, that was no problem. So long so long so long as it was exposed for all to see. Uh, that so- actually reminds me of something else. That, that was part of the argument that uh, Costas made. That in a lot of the the regulations that Massachusetts trotted out. He was saying, okay, well, first of all, a lot of these are rooted in good old-fashioned racism. I don't think you want to go there. Uh, Secondly, these were prohibitions against concealed carry because open carry was perfectly fine and legal. And then third, in some of the very same regulations the state used in their defense, it specifically says that uh, these rules are relaxed for travelers who it's acknowledged won't have the time to know the local regulations and they're just passing through. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he covered those two. It's a really good read. And, yeah. And the only, the only other, the only other correction that actually that, uh, that you mentioned, and I assume likely wasn't followed was the, uh, uh, the firearms owner protection act specifies that for a fire firearm to fall under that protection, it needs to be unloaded and, and locked in a uh, a locked in a container that is not accessible to the operator of the vehicle. So you're you're right. The FOPA wasn't mentioned. I just brought it up as an illustration mm-hmm. um, because, from what I can tell, it didn't appear that they were actually spending time in Massachusetts. They were just on the road. Yep. Yep. No, it's it's certainly a. Uh... Yeah, uh, uh, not not a, not a great scene, and uh, I'm very very glad to hear that uh, that uh, we've got some good legal minds working on it, and uh, and Pink Pistols is is uh, is attaching their themselves to this. So this is this is very very good news, and hopefully uh, this will go through. Because again, 
We could we could argue about where carry permits are, but I mean, historically, they weren't. They definitely weren't something that existed at the time of the uh, the the ratification of the Second Amendment, and uh, mm-hmm. certainly did was there were you know many many years of firearms as well as many years of firearms advancement, and you know when the when the percussion revolver was invented, nobody suddenly said, "Well, we can't have people carrying these things around," um, mm-hmm. and so it's just you know, <laughs> machine guns existed for I want to say fifty years. Before the uh, the NFA was filed and put actually started putting restrictions on machine guns, so clearly there is no oh the founding fathers couldn't have envisioned this it do, it does not covered by the Second Amendment because nobody cared uh, the, the the only time suddenly people started caring about was oh poor people and uh, minorities might be able to carry these so yeah this is that is some absolutely good uh, good news and hopefully the uh, the case will be successful on the side of freedom. Um, we shall see. Uh, and then I, uh, this next one here is, uh, I, I loved it cause this is also a, another, um, uh, uh, unconstitutional carry one. This is not quite as broad as well. We'll, we'll have to see how the, um, um, uh, how the, uh, the case that, uh, um, the, the Donald case goes, goes through, uh, for the, for, for a ruling, uh, but uh, in this case, it is uh, adding on the carry restrictions for uh, a Maryland uh, uh, concealed carry permit. Uh, let's see. Um, so, so in Maryland, you are not allowed to uh, to carry a firearm in establishments selling alcohol for on-site consumption, uh, private buildings or property without the owner's consent, uh, or with, with, within 1,000 feet of a public uh, demonstration. And uh, and that those have been deemed unconstitutional by the court, which uh, is really nice, especially given that it is in Maryland. And did I read correctly that this was? Uh, yes, this was a uh, a Barack Obama appointee. Really, we've mm-hmm. started seeing people have started mentioning it. And I'm 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 mentioning it here only because people kind of have it as like reading tea leaves on the, Oh, was it, are they a Republican appointee or a Democrat appointee? And, uh, we, uh, well, we're, we're going to be talking about a, a, a George W. Bush appointee in just a few minutes, which may not be quite as, uh, as, as nice as we, uh, we expected. But in this case, this, uh, this seems like a pretty good ruling. Obviously the, the, uh, the state has some appeals, so it's, uh, it, it things still may change. But it's still it's a good start. It is a very good start. I'm just a little disappointed that Pink Pistols wasn't asked to join this because mm. they mentioned one of the key um, members of this is Maryland Shell Issue. And in I don't remember if it was 2016 or 2017, but it was very early on under Blazing Sword. Um they were the first people to ask me to come up and and speak at one of their meetings, and I was happy to do so. And it's like, dude, MSI, I, I thought we were buds. Why didn't you ask me to get in on this? <laughs> you know, I would have said yes. So I've I've got some. It, it's not fear of missing out. It, it's regret because I missed out. Yeah. Uh, so I'm. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm really happy this happened. It's more a case of, oh, I wanted to be a piece of this. But yeah, the important thing is that it passed. Mm-hmm. And then, oh, another, another, uh, another carry, carry one. And uh, this one is this one I really like. <laughs> is that uh, this is now? I got to try to remember. I've got all these different carry cases to so this, the specific. Uh, uh, we're talking about New York, right? Yes, we're talking about New York, and I'm trying okay. to remember. What- Go ahead. Okay, well, I, I, I've got it here, so I'll cover it for you. So this is up in Suffolk County, New York. I don't know where it is because I'm not a Yankee, but I just know that it's not New York City. And short version, the, the county has decided that they are giving up and they don't want to defend their decision to suspend uh, pistol licenses held by longtime residents of the county. And this has been going on for two years. So here's what happened. Um, in 2021, you've got these two license holders and their husband and wife, Thomas and Diane, and they're also parents. 
And what happened was in 2017, the police uh, visited their home for a, they call it a mental health assistance call, sounds like a welfare check, related to their adult son, who I presume was living there. And there is a New York regulation somewhere that you have to report this. And their defense was, but the police weren't checking on us. They were checking on our son. So we didn't need to report this to the licensing bureau. And because we didn't need mental health, we didn't see any point in having to report this. And so um, the state disagreed and revoked their permits. And the police also ordered them to surrender their firearms to local authorities. And so the couple has been disarmed by force by the county ever since. And so a lawsuit was filed in 2022, and the county has tried to defend its actions and hasn't done it very well. And in uh, July of this year, the county got the district judge, Gary Brown, good and mad, who, I'm just going to quote from Bearing Arms here, who scolded the county's attorneys in a blistering order that accused Suffolk County of making the spurious argument uh, that the Second Amendment rights of the dem- of the family wasn't implicated by suspension of the pistol licenses. Okay, that went too long. But the point being, scolded the attorneys in a blistering order. And it's legalese for, I am really getting tired of your crap, county. Straighten up and fly right or I'm going to slap you harder. And the county was directed in capital letters uh, to file a supplemental brief of no more than 10 pages setting forth its position, uh, you know, basically justify this under Bruin and Rahimi within 10 days. And um, also he, the judge, um, forced the county to pay attorney's fees. And so less than a month after all this happens, the county just decides that it's going to roll over and give in. And it, uh, I don't know if I've got the quote here. Eh, I can't find it at the moment. But it's its basically along the lines of, yeah, we've decided that it's just not worth it. And we, yeah, here we go. Quote, um... The county now believes it would not be wise to continue litigating the question of whether the alleged policies challenged in this case comport with the Second Amendment. And different quote, wishes to resolve this case by making policy changes sought by plaintiffs and according them and affording them pecuniary relief, end quote. So pecuniary relief is a really fancy legal word for we're going to give them money. Um, Most likely, uh... The attorney's fees that are mentioned and probably anything else associated, you know, the court costs, the whatever. So they're going to get it really seems like they are going to get a monetary award and get their licenses and guns back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. And unlike the previous cases we're talking about, you can't appeal a case that you've conceded because. Now, I do want to point out that I, I haven't heard yet whether or not the family is going to take this judgment or if they're going to continue with the trial. Um, Like a lot of people, I have mixed decisions. On the other hand, yeah, take the win, Mm -hmm. because I'm sure you're tired of it, but it may not result in a change. But if they continue in the trial, then that could result in long changes to the way the counties run. That's true. Oh, and by the way, I I looked it up. This is the county that's at the very, very distal tip of Long Island. So, uh, yeah, the, so this is the this is the the the, the very very far end o- away from New York City on Long Island. Long Island. Long Island. Yes. <laughs> All right, and let's see. Oh, now we're getting into the assault weapon cases. So this case here is uh, Lane v. I believe oh, that's that's Roca, uh, mm-hmm. a challenge against New, uh, New York City's assault weapons ban. Um, 
And so, uh, yet we're still waiting on the ruling on that. But essentially, this is yet another case that is declaring an assault weapons ban uh, to be unconstitutional. Um, I don't know how much we need to dig into this one because it's it's a quote unquote assault weapon and uh, and 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 magazine ban. They're crap. There's no support for it. These are this goes against uh, this goes against Nyserpa. This also goes against Heller. Uh, and McDonald's. So, uh, yeah, there's, it, it seems like pretty on its face. It's a pretty, uh, it, 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 it should be a slam dunk, but that's not the world we live in. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it just seems that all we have here is something from a firearms policy coalition about how they're challenging it, but I don't see anything else about it. What yeah. am I missing? No, the, yeah, this one's just got the list, the listings of all the ver- the various filings and all of that. And so, yeah, I just, I, I just skimmed it. I, I was, uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't super in the mood to pull out some, some scathing legal quotes if there are some. And I apologize if that's, if that's what you're going through, but I just wanted to, uh, note okay. that there is, there, there is another challenge coming in. And, uh, the more of these challenges, uh, the better it goes through. Cause right now the court appears to be not that interested in hearing an assault weapons case. Um, I, I, I don't know the rules for how the court goes, but uh, the more cases that start coming up uh, up to the various court circuits, the more pressure the Supreme Court is going to have to actually make a ruling because everyone's complaining because all of these, you know, anti-gun states are pushing, you know, onerous carry permits uh, and then an onerous gun uh, uh Owners carry permits, heavy carry restrictions like the one in Maryland, and uh, and 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 banning the types of guns people can have. Good word of use, by the way. Yeah, thank you. And then the last one, and this one's, I guess this one's kind of the bittersweet. I probably should have ended on this one, but uh, uh, well, it, it, I will say that we will have to see how things are are implemented on this because uh, this. Uh, this ruling came out on uh, on on July thirtieth, uh, but it's it's baby steps is, is really what you're saying. It, it it's a it's good, but it's just a little step, but maybe more. Yeah, well, I mean, again, it, it's it's a question of most of the people uh, who are legal minds who are reading this are finding that it kind of reads one way, but that's weird, and so essentially, big picture, uh, this was a, this was a case that. Um, uh, this was a case that was, uh, against, uh, New Jersey's assault weapons ban. Uh, and the judge, uh, ruled that it was unconstitutional. But you're, as you're definitely right on baby sets is the judge did not believe that magazine restrictions, the magazine restrictions was part of this and did not, uh, uh, did not agree that the magazine restriction was also unconstitutional. Uh, because they are simply a part of the gun and the gun still functions without the, uh, the larger magazine. And so therefore bans of certain magazines, uh, they, he believed was not, uh, constitute, not unconstitutional or was, was constitutional. <laughs> well, it, it's even more restrictive than that because as it says in like the second paragraph, the judge's ruling is limited in scope. It applies to only one type of firearm. Mm-hmm. And it specifically says the Colt AR-15. And I'm pretty sure I know how that's going to be argued. Because to you and I, we understand that to mean it applies to the AR-15, but not to the AK-47 or the SCAR or anything else like that. I can just see that New Jersey is going to argue that this only applies to AR-15s manufactured by the Colt Corporation and not AR-15s manufactured by Spikes or Palmetto or Daniel Defense or anything else like that yep. because they are going to use every dirty tactic they can and the judge gave them that. We'll see if they have the stones to do it. That's why That's why I am, I am waiting to see. That certainly is my prediction because this is New Jersey and they are a very, very anti-gun state. Uh, but at, also at the same time, there might be a chance, again, Pollyanna speaking here, that they might decide that they know that this is against an assault weapons ban, which is, I don't, I don't remember the specific wording of New Jersey's one, but essentially... They're all feature test 
band, as well as uh, Guns by Name. And the overall statement is essentially anything that is an AR-15 or anything that's like an AR-15. So, mm-hmm. and so because of that, uh, it, it would it would seem very hypocritical that it would only not only apply to only the AR-15, um, but also you know, but not you know anything else, but also only AR-15s that are specifically made in Hartford, Connecticut. Well, yeah, but I mean. With the gun prohibitionists, you know that they're hypocrites. Oh, for sure. <laughs> for absolutely sure. I mean, the best example was when, you know, the when uh, Heller and McDonald were coming through, all the anti groups are going, oh, I thought I thought the uh, I thought the uh, the conservatives and libertarians were all about states rights. What about the states rights ability? You know, the states rights to restrict guns. Uh, but meanwhile, these are also the exact same people that pushed a federal assault weapons ban on us and are constantly mm-hmm. trying to uh, to to renew that uh, mm-hmm. those those federal laws. So, yeah, no, no, no. They they only care about states rights when they yeah. when, when, when they're losing. Yeah, but I absolutely get what you're saying in regards to the evil features and a good lawyer can argue it that way. So there's wiggle room on both sides. Yep. And I mean, the judge specifically said the reason why they said uh, the Colt AR-15 was because that was the specific pattern of firearm that he was briefed on uh, by the uh, by, by the lawyers. So, I mean, we have the ruling. And so, yeah, mm-hmm. there's probably a good chance that it's going to be ruled that it is uh um uh that that it was uh that yep no that's the well, only thing I put. go ahead yeah it, it really just depends on whether or not our side can outwiggle the other side mm-hmm. and certainly if if that's the that that's 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 the way it goes this certainly could be grounds for an appeal uh, i don't know if that's going to be or 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 a uh, an additional case I don't know which one is the is the safer move. Would it be better to to charge an additional case uh, and, and start and start over fresh or appeal? Because uh, you know, would would one be the you know have the risk that we would lose the baby steps that we're doing? Because again, gun owners need to adopt the one good tactic the anti-gunners have and the one thing that they've been very very successful at getting us to this point is incrementalism anything any little any port in the storm if it's if if it's anti-gun they like it and they want it and we should be the same way as liking liking anything that is uh is in the right direction towards second amendment rights so yeah this is kind of a weak ruling as far as they go it's certainly not what we were hoping for but at the same time, it's better than a, mm-hmm. you know, Ninth, ninth Circuit ruling. Mm-hmm. And yeah, baby steps are important because they inch that Overton window forward. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, that that's the news. And yeah, like I said, it's it, they're all different shades of good news. Oh, and by mm-hmm. the way, that uh, that case was was the one that was ruled by a uh, George W. Bush appointee. So. The one kind of bittersweet one was was uh, was was ruled by a uh, uh, by a Republican appointed judge, and uh, I only say that just because again the Second Amendment should be nonpartisan, and I look forward to a day when it totally is. Well, one of the things I like about this particular judgment is that the judge makes no bones about his feelings regarding guns, and. You know, he, he, he talks about the reckless inaction of our governmental leaders to address the mass shooting tragedy affecting our nation. And so you, you know how he feels, but he says that, well, the Supreme Court has ruled this particular way. And so despite how I feel, I have to follow the precedent of the highest court of the land. And so... I, I respect him for that. He, he he hates it with every fiber of his being, but according to how the law is written, he's going to follow it. Mm-hmm. So good for him. Yeah, that is that 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 is good. And again, this is not the good news we were hoping for, but good news is good news. Mm-hmm. So moving on to our first segment. The duality of man. Xander has recently been talking about farming, but before he was back on the family farm, he was farming electrons at a computer company, so he knows farming and cybersecurity. 
Welcome to Independent Thoughts with yours truly, Xander Opal. As I've mentioned before, one of my hobbies is security. I've heard in security podcasts that often management will blame the person on the spot for security breaches, whether physical or digital. A person can be caught at just the wrong moment, or right moment from the viewpoint of the perpetrator, and give out a piece of information the perpetrator needs to get past security measures by appearing to be a legitimate person. Or someone might be reflexively polite, holding a door for someone whose hands are full with a box or a briefcase and laptop bag. The person on the spot, with good training and support, can be the best line of defense instead. Training in how to politely request someone badge in themselves to resist being rushed or pressured. Not taking shortcuts out of impatience or helpfulness when calmly going step by step will ensure a good outcome for legitimate personnel and a fail for those who aren't. Gun owners who seek training serve the same purpose for society. Folks have noted an increase in people wanting training after a constitutional or permitless carry is passed in a state. These people are making themselves a stronger link rather than a weak link when someone attempts something nefarious, whether it is a theft with the threat of harm or someone wanting to make headlines with a spree killing. The best results are when the erstwhile perpetrator is stopped right at the beginning without a chance to get at their goal. Just as with a facility where security can't be manning every door, the citizen who is trained to deal with situations where someone threatens harm can often stop their perpetrator in the tracks before things go past threats. While a gun is not a magic wand, a situation that ends without a shot fired is an excellent result. Whether someone is trying to cause physical harm or financial damage, the strongest link in defense is a reasonable and reasonably trained person who doesn't let themselves be rushed into a mistake. The weakest link is someone who is rendered powerless by authorities, prevented from being empowered with tools, knowledge, and support. Perpetrators seek out weak links and are stopped by strong links who stand in their way. By no means is it perfect, whether in digital or physical security. Tools give some chance, knowledge gives some chance. Tools, knowledge, and support from authority is the biggest chance for success and safety a person can get. Have fun, be safe, I hope I gave you something to think about. Oh, um, yeah, weird, you know, the link things, show notes, whatever. So, just to to, to add on, I included one of uh, uh, Jason Street's DEF CON talks about pen testing, uh, just because he is just such a character. Uh, he's pay, you know, penetration testers. They're, they're, they're charged to test the secu- They're p- paid to test the security of, uh, uh, various companies. And, uh, and essentially he turns into a Disney villain when he, when he, when he, when he gets his, uh, when he gets his, uh, his permission to start, uh, to start testing the security barriers. And, uh, if you got time, check, check out his talk. It is hilarious. Uh, my wife has zero interest in this and she ended up watching this, uh, this one with me and thought it was just absolutely amazing. Uh, but one of the things he talks about, I actually, I didn't get a chance to watch the whole thing, uh, before, uh, uh, before we started recording to refresh my memory, but I know he's the one that will openly say if he's looking to get into an area that requires, uh, higher badge access, he will absolutely roll up to that door uh, just behind somebody in a wheelchair with a box of books on his lap and going, yeah, shut the door in my face. Don't don't <laughs> hold the door for me. Yeah, he also uh, he's he's uh, he, he's he's a cybersecurity guy for a company as a day as a day job, or at least he was in the in the time of, of this. This is a fairly old talk. Uh, and he mentions that uh, one of the things he does is if he tells people to send him phishing links and other uh, other potential security threats that they see. And he says anybody who's an I.T. person, send them, you know, send send back praise. Thank you so much for sending this to me. Even if you've seen it for the millionth time and you're just going, yep, saw this one, throw it, throw it in the trash, uh, and all that praise them because you want people to be excited and interested in keeping the secure security up. Because if you start dismissing them, they might forget to, uh, or, or, or might not think it's important for them to send stuff. And they they might see something that you've missed. 
reward the behavior you want to see. Mm-hmm. And so that that's something that I see a lot. Um, yeah, minor rant here. You know, if, if you're an introvert and you finally find the energy to come out and deal with people and the first thing out of their mouths is something like, oh, nice of you to join us. Ooh. You, yeah, you, you have just sabotaged that behavior because now you've taught that introvert, oh, so even when I do come out, you're going to tell me I'm not good enough. Instead, in, <laughs> instead of penalizing the behavior you want to see, reward the behavior you want to see. And so, you know, legitimately say, hey, good to see you. Come on in. And it, it's the same with cybersecurity. And yeah, you may end up seeing the same link a hundred times. But you are teaching them, hey, this looks funny. I'm going to consult a professional rather than, well, I'm just going to get scolded. So I don't know. Might as well click on the link. Yep. Yeah. And the, the whole thing, that's definitely what he doesn't want to say is, yeah, no, I've seen that a million times. You know, you, you've also got a B4 thought because, yeah, the, the, the millionth time you've seen, you know, an old phishing email that's just floating around and all that. Yeah, you may not want to see more of that behavior, but you got to remember where that behavior comes from. And yeah, no, mm-hmm. it's, uh, early on in my wife and I's marriage, I uh, she came home from work and I said, oh, by the way, I know that the stove has been really gross. Check it out. I decided that I, I was sick of looking at it dirty too. I cleaned it up and she goes, ugh, you did a terrible job. I'm like, well, <laughs> guess what I'm not going to do anymore. Uh-huh. <laughs> So yeah, that's uh, no, that is absolutely a uh, a a, a, gr- a great point to remember <laughs> about everything in life. Uh huh. Uh yeah, I really enjoy watching the videos from uh, a woman called the Dadvocate, and and she's talking about how women will, on one hand, complain about their men doing something like you aren't folding the to- towels properly, or whatever, and then refold them. You know, usually. Ah, you know, you're incompetent. Let me do it. And then they get upset that the men aren't doing anything. Yeah. And so it's just, <laughs> well, first of all, I think her advice is, look, does it really matter how the towels are folded? I mean, they're folded. Don't worry about it. But if you can't live with it, change them yourself quietly <laughs> and, and, you know, don't, don't make the guy not want to help. So... Yep. Or, 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 or just do the gentle thing is thank you so much for folding this towel. I really, really appreciate it. But just so you know, I like it better if you fold it this way. You know, there's mm-hmm. two ways to ask, do you know, do you prefer the toilet paper coming off the top or the bottom of the roll? You know, the, you could say, mm-hmm. God, why do you put it coming off the bottom of the roll? What are you, an animal? Or you could say, thank you so much for putting a fresh roll of toilet paper on the, uh, on the, uh, on, on the, on the toilet roll. But uh, mm-hmm. could you could you run it off the top instead of the bottom? Yeah, and in my experience, most men really like that kind of guidance. Yeah, I I, I certainly do, and yeah, you'll you'll get a, you'll get you'll get a lot a lot far farther with uh, with uh, with with happy respectful correction than chiding. Mm-hmm. Zeros with red dots aren't just Japanese airplanes. David explains in greater detail. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to Gun Lovers and Other Strangers. Recently, I talked about the process of mounting and zeroing scopes. Xander also discussed his trials and tribulations, sighting in the optic on his air rifle. So in this segment, I'd like to talk about zeroing red dots on long guns and handguns. When used on a rifle, red dots can be treated pretty much the same way as other optics. However, on handguns, especially compact pistols, there are some additional challenges when sighting red dot sights, also called RMRs for rear-mounted red dots. On rifles, most red dot sights are set up to either bottom third or co-witness with the iron sights, if any. These two terms mean that the iron sights either appear below the dot, generally in the bottom third of the viewable area while the dot remains in the center, or the dot lines up precisely with the existing sights. Handgun RMRs nearly always co-witness with the pistol's iron sights. This can make adjusting the red dot easier, assuming the iron sights are properly adjusted, of course. If using a spud-type bore sight, either collimator or laser style, the bore insert may be too long to seat properly in the handgun barrel, with the end of the spud impacting the breech face before it can solidly fit the muzzle. The magnetic or laser cartridge bore sights should still work as designed. 
old school bore sighting, where the target is viewed through the barrel and the sight is adjusted to coincide, obviously won't work with a semi automatic pistol. Mirrored barrel inserts have been available now and again over the years for use with revolvers. Good luck finding one. That leaves the most fun option actually shooting the gun and adjusting the point of aim and point of impact. When using this technique, the most important element is having the firearm properly braced. For pistols, a ransom rest or something similar is ideal, but very pricey, both for the base unit and the grip adapters. I 3D printed a rest for sighting in my firearms. A traditional commercial rifle rest, sandbags, or even a bunch of tightly rolled or folded cloth can all work nearly as well as a fixed rest. As long as the shooter maintains consistency, grip, position, and orientation of the firearm. With a handgun, the rest and firearm should be positioned so the shooter's forearms are also supported. With a long gun, this applies to the elbows. The goal here is to remove as much of the human element as possible from the process. Next, set up a target at a known range. I prefer starting handguns at 5 yards and rifles at 10, just in case the sighting system is way off. As Xander mentioned, having the dot contrast clearly with the target color is important for proper visibility. Once all this is done, load 5 rounds into the magazine or cylinder and make ready to shoot. Even if the firearm has less than a 5 round capacity, still use this quantity for the course of fire. While traditionally 3 rounds have been used for sighting, I prefer using 5 round groups. I've found that 5 shots reduces the uncertainty considerably. For example, if I have two shots close together and one flyer off to the side, I have to wonder if the ones in close proximity are coincidental or a clear representation of the firearm's potential accuracy, and I just pulled one shot. Meanwhile, with five round groups, this issue practically vanishes. Four shots close together with one flyer is much easier to judge. As with other optics, most RMRs will have some system for adjusting the emitter. A fairly common one is recessed screws turned by a small hex wrench, which is frequently supplied with the optic. Pay close attention to those adjustment points. They should be marked with an arrow and the letter U for up or L for left. Very rarely will you see D for down or R for right marked on them. If there are no markings, check the manual or manufacturer's website. Also be aware some optics have a third screw for locking the adjustments. As I mentioned, consistency is key. Fire five rounds while maintaining the same sight picture as closely as possible. Hopefully, all the hits are in close proximity, even if they aren't at the point of aim. Tune the vertical and horizontal adjustments, and repeat. Within a few cycles of this process, the shots should be landing where the dot appears on the target. If necessary, put up a new target at the intended zero distance and repeat for final adjustments. At this point, the red dot should be properly sighted in, and, barring a problem, shouldn't require any further adjustments. The only other thing we'll need to do is make sure the battery is changed regularly. Some of the newer red dots have auto off and shake awake features, with battery life measured in thousands of hours. There are even units with small solar panels to keep the battery topped off when exposed to light. Some of the most recent red dots don't even use batteries and instead use a fiber optic to produce the dot. Whether the optic has these features or not, find out how long the battery actually lasts and make sure to schedule replacement within this envelope. Shoot often, shoot safely, shoot accurately. What does an expensive red dot get me over a cheap? That about wraps up this segment. If you have any questions for me or suggestions for future segments or a comment on a past segment, please post them on the Assorted Calibers podcast, Facebook, or MeWe pages, and Aaron or Weird will make sure I see them. I'm also a contributor on the Blue Collar Prepping blog, which can be found at bluecollarprepping.blogspot.com. Finally, I'm a published author, and books with my stories can be found on Amazon under the names Brenna Bach and David Bach. That's all for now. Thanks for listening. I'm David, and this is Gun Lovers and Other Strangers. (laughs) 
I will say that uh, just before we started the show, David uh, realized that he forgot to mention that if you're using a bore sight that bears against the muzzle of the firearm, uh, be aware that any muzzle device like a flash hider or a compensator may not be perfectly concentric with the bore uh, or uh, or to parallel to the crown. Uh, so this will throw off the accuracy of the bore sight, to which I responded that unless that muzzle device is really, really eccentric, like it's... The bore sight is only getting the gun on the page, and then and his previous segment on zeroing is it, you're always going to have to do that unless you're really lucky. And Aaron, do you know who's really lucky? I mean, I know the answer. I was trying to come up with something clever. <laughs> eh, nothing's happening. <laughs> so, so you know, our listeners, our listeners, because they're always after me, lucky charms. <laughs> Oh, thank you each and every one of our listeners. But we got to give a very special thanks to all our supporters on Patreon. To become a Patreon patron, go to patreon.com slash sort of calibers podcast to sign up. Patrons get an early release of the podcast, plus bonus content like our hilarious blooper reels, the ACP film tracks, the ACU mag dump, and Aaron's special project, speaking of Shogun. Also, please remember to rate us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe to us on the platform of your choice, and share the show with your friends, both online and off. Or or don't. Whatever. I'm not your mother. You can get more from me at my blog, which is weirdworld.com. That's W-E-E-R-D world.com. And hear me weekly on Handgun Radio on the Firearms Radio Network. I got a link tree, but no one reads my stuff anyway, so it doesn't matter. Eee! All one word. Yep. And thanks to Nate Spencer for our music. I can't think of what to say, but I'm sure that Weird Beard is going to love it anyway because he loves everything I do. Our sense of taste and quality is assorted, very much so in this case. And so is our podcast. Good night, everyone. Aaron Blood is awesome, everybody. Aaron Blood is awesome.